Okay. So it's specifically in this, in this lecture, I want to look at a number of challenges um, in using cost effectiveness evidence. And one particular issue is what's described as setting the cost effectiveness threshold. Now, if we're measuring cost effectiveness as the cost per quality adjusted life year gained, or cost per additional quality, if that's how we're measuring it, the issue that arises immediately is what additional cost should we be willing to spend to get an additional quality? And that's known as the cost effectiveness threshold. And it's a threshold in the sense that once you've decided how much you're willing to spend to get one more quality, once you've set that limit or threshold, if your analysis suggests a new intervention produces qualities at a much higher cost, it's over the threshold and probably will not get selected, probably will not get funded. In the other direction, if your analysis suggests the cost per quality gained is less than the threshold value, well then you may be quite likely to recommend that particular program or intervention or technology. So setting a threshold is very important. As we'll see, the quality is, while it's a powerful tool, it has limitations and it's trying to capture the health benefit, but arguably, and more so for some conditions than others, arguably it will fail to really capture the full health benefit of an intervention or a therapy. And so the issue arises, are there ways we could improve on our quality measure to develop a measure that's better able to capture the health benefits? And I'll look at some issues there. Um, one way of approaching it is to recognize that uh, some qualities or quality adjusted life years may be more valuable than others. And I want to consider a set of reasons why that might be the case. Another issue you need to focus on is what I've described here as a tension between cost effectiveness and affordability. And the tension is this. In many healthcare systems, an intervention might appear to be cost effective. In other words, a good use of resources, uh, a relatively low cost way of acquiring additional health benefit. It may appear to be a, a value for money. But that doesn't mean the money is there and it's affordable. That, that we then have the money in place, the budgets available to purchase this new technology or therapy. And this is a particular problem uh, in low and middle income countries where there may be evidence that the intervention is a good use of resources, but there's no space in the healthcare budget to pay for it. And so we have a tension. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit. And the final um, section of this morning's lecture, I'm going to look at a few examples, particularly from England, of different organizations utilizing economic information to uh, inform decision making. I'm using England partly because I'm f highly familiar with it, but also England's probably at, at one extreme. Probably more than any other country, England is prepared to use economic information to influence its decisions in healthcare. It's not the only country that is, but it's probably at one extreme. Okay, 
Um, in terms of language, am I going at an all right, uh, sort of okay speed? Um, I know you're in you know, international graduate studies, you do it in English. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, if, if, if I go to, if, if I speed up and you want me to slow down again, let me know. Okay. Right, the cost per additional quality. That's our basic measure of cost effectiveness. Now, there are lots of other measures. I mean, if you were looking at a, uh, a new bisphosphonate in order to prevent f fractures of bones and so on, vertebral fractures, hip fractures, you could, of course, look at the cost per fracture prevented. Or um, you could look at interventions and look at cost per additional life year gained. So there are alternatives, but the quality is perhaps the dominant approach. And it's the, it's the dominant approach because in principle, you can use it in lots of different areas of healthcare activity. So it's, you could use it to look at new strategies um, for screening for cancer. You could use qualities to measure outcomes when you're looking at um, new treatments for plaque psoriasis. You could look at new drugs for um, preventing cardiovascular problems such as stroke or myocardial infarction. You could use a quality. In principle, uh, in mental health, you could use qualities as well. I say in principle because it's, it's, it's less obvious how powerful the quality is or how well adapted it is perhaps in mental health. But it can still be used in mental health. It is used, but uh, perhaps the quality is at its greatest strength when the area of healthcare involves a wider range of physical functioning. But I think it's fair to say that even the most enthusiastic advocate of qualities recognizes the limitations of qualities. And in any decision-making context, it's highly unlikely an individual or a committee will want to just make their decision on the basis of cost per quality. So the cost per quality gained is an important aspect of most decisions, but it's surely not our only concern. And so the issue arises, how uh, should we take into account the other factors that we want to influence our decision? And I'll give some examples of that in the latter half of this lecture.